Okay. Um, so this is our current, uh, let me just minimize this. So this is our current uh, schedule here. Um, so we are right here. And uh, so there is an assignment due this weekend. Uh, so assignment one is due on the Saturday uh, at 11 uh, p.m. And then there's a quiz next week, which, so it's going to be a little bit different from typical quizzes because it's going to be online. It'll be over a series of days. I think uh, it's not confirmed yet, but it'll probably be Monday to Wednesday. And then, um, uh, yeah, so you can start it whenever you want. And then once you start it, you'll have 60 minutes to finish it. And they're not meant to be, um, so there's four of them. They're, they're meant to be sort of short quizzes. They're not supposed to be uh, a killer or anything like that. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, do study, but, uh, and uh, sometime this week, so sometime here, I will release a practice quiz uh, so that you have some idea of what what sort of questions you'll be getting and you can properly prepare for them. Um, okay. And I think that about covers it. Uh, so uh, this week actually is the first uh, actual tutorial as well. Yeah. So there's a tutorial. It's, it's already open. Um, you watch the video. You do a short quiz activity, but the, the nice thing about this quiz activity is there is no time limit. Uh, you have to have it done. I mean, there is a time limit. You have to have it done uh, June 1st, uh, Monday night, but uh, you can start it and uh, finish it any time between now and then. So um, it is a little bit different though. So if you have questions, uh, don't be afraid to ask. Um, a little bit about the protocol of asking questions. So um, when I'm giving these lectures, uh, sometimes people will, will chat, which is great. Um, they ask questions and then other students answer those questions, which is fantastic. Um, I'm not going to answer the chat unless um, I pose the question. But uh, does it give the mark? No, it doesn't give the... Um, no, I think I, I turn the marks off right now because I want... If I give you the marks, then, um, you know, that opens the door for somebody else. Uh, you being able to tell somebody else uh what the answers are right if you know your mark then you probably know where you went wrong so i just kind of want to avoid that um so i will uh release it. as soon as the due date is up i will release the marks and if i forget you can just remind me um so yeah if i pose questions i'll answer the chat otherwise i won't answer the chat there's a uh a hand raising thing that you can do if you raise your hand i, I will take that as a question to me during your lecture and don't be afraid to do that if you don't understand something or you know, also uh, ask questions of your uh, your fellow students in the chat. That's great. Um, I really like when you guys can uh, you know uh, figure this stuff out and and because by answering questions too, you learn a lot as well. So um, all right. So any questions on uh, any other questions on this uh, um, schedule here? Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this and then I will, uh, I'm going to turn off my video because I put my computer at a weird angle and uh, it doesn't show much of me anyway. Um, and then I will uh, start the lecture. So. Uh, what happened? I hit the wrong one. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, good. So as usual, uh, um, my standard disclaimer, these are based on slides by Dr. Robert Collier. So if you know anything, any mistakes you see are almost certainly mine and anything you see that is uh, wonderfully well articulated, those are uh, his. Um, so today we're going to talk about introduction to predicate logic. So uh, last class we talked about uh, logical expressions, um, we talked about implication, and we talked about different forms of that implication, the inverse, the converse, and the contrapositive. Um, and we talked about the English translations of all that, and then we looked at logical equivalences. So uh, given a logical expression, you can say that it's equivalent to another logical expression. Uh, if the truth tables match, or 
um, you can transform one into another using the equivalence rules, or you can transform both expressions into full disjunctive normal form and show that they are the same there. So that's last class's lecture. Um, This, this week, we will be talking about predicate logic. So um, we're taking, uh, it's, it's still the same uh, topic of propositional logic, but we're going to add a little bit onto it. So we're going to add a few structures onto it. Um, we're going to use quantifiers and show how they work. So the quantifiers that we're going to look at are for all, and that's written like this, the upside down A. And there exists, and that's written as this backwards E. And we're going to look at their translations into English. Um, and it's important to note these are just, it's just simply propositional logic, but it's shorthand. Uh, so these, these symbols are shorthand for uh, stuff that we've already seen. Um, sort of. And then we're going to look at, uh, then we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to look at inference and argument. So we're going to look at how to start to argue something. Basically, the, the, all this is leading up to doing proofs. Um, and not just proofs, but being able to argue anything through reason and logic. Uh, you know, given some set of facts, we're going to argue that uh, some certain conclusion is true. So we're going to look at what a valid and a sound argument are. And then we're going to look at the rules of inference, which means basically if I take some uh, proposition, uh, some expression, and I know that it's true, then I can infer other things that are also true. Uh, so that's what we're going to learn uh, this week. Um, okay, so I wish. I think, uh, sorry, guys. All right, I think we're back. Um, okay, so introduction to predicates. So the following assertions are not propositions. Uh, X greater than three or Mr. X is taller than Mr. Y. Um, if we say that uh, Mr. X and Mr. Y are variables and we don't know how tall they necessarily are. So these are just placeholder variables. The same as this X, we don't know the value of this X. So that's where we get this. Uh, sorry. I'm trying to find a good spot for this thing. Um, so that's where we get this idea that uh, we can't pin down the values of these things. So. Uh, we call these predicates because the value is predicated on the value of the variable. So if we know the value of X or we know the value of how tall Mr. X is and how tall Mr. Y is, then we can state something about these. They become propositions, All right? If we supply values, they become propositions. So all possible values a variable may have is called the universe of discourse. So let's see some examples of that. Um, so if we have this predicate here, x is greater than 3, um, then we might say that x can take on any integer value. So this is uh, very similar to um, a type in programming. So if you've done any programming at this point, um, so I know Python is sort of, uh, uses duck typing. So, um, you know, it uh, you can reassign variables, but... Uh, uh, if you use something like Java, then you have to you do have to declare each type um, before you use it. Before you use a variable, you have to declare the type, and then you're restricted to use only that type. So this is, I guess, in a sense, closer to Java than to uh, than to Python, um, because we're going to restrict ourselves to uh, to something. And I mean, it doesn't have to be a tight restriction, but um, we do have to declare what the universe of discourse is. All right. So for example, we have this predicate, x is greater than three, um, and it's not a proposition. There's no true or false value until we assign x a value from the universe of discourse. So for instance, if we give x the value four, then we can say that x greater than three is equivalent to four is greater than three, and that is true. So now we have a proposition with a value of true. On the other hand, we can also assign x from, you know, since it could take on any integer, we can assign it the value two. And then when we look at X greater than three, well, that's equivalent to two greater than three, and that has a value of false. So now that becomes a proposition with a value of false. So predicates can also be assigned to variables. This is sort of a, 
a notation thing, uh, similar to propositions, except the predicates that now have arguments, right? So if we say that x is greater than three is a predicate, um, then we can assign this x greater than three predicate to the variable p, and we would write uh, p of x uh, is equal to x greater than three. So we always, inside the brackets here, we want to list the arguments. Similar, I guess, again, to if you've done any programming, uh, when you have to declare a method, you have to declare the arguments that are, are going to be passed into that method. Okay, so let's look at uh, let's look at let's get closer to using these uh, quantified predicates here. So let the universe of discourse be the integers one, two, and three, and let p of x be the predicate x is greater than zero. So in this case, we know for all the possible values that x can take. Um, p of x has a value of true. And so how can we express this? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so we can express it as p1 and p2 and p3. So we can pass in one into this one, two into this one, and three into this one. And each one of those individually is going to evaluate to true. So when we and them together using the logical ands, um, this will equal true. All right, so sometimes we want to do that. Sometimes we want to say, well, this predicate is true for all the possible values that the variable can take. So if the universe of discourse is large, this expression can become very large and cumbersome. Um, for example, um, if we say the universe of discourse is all natural numbers, that is the numbers from one to infinity, and p of x is the same predicate x greater than zero, then all values of x give p of x a value of true, but how do we express that? Well, now it becomes a little bit more cumbersome. So this is a perfectly valid way to express it, um, but you can see how it's, you know, we're starting to get a little bit ambiguous here, and this is not, uh, you know, it gets a little clunky, a little bit clumsy to write, and uh, we want basically a shorthand to writing this. So that's where the, the quantifier comes in. The quantifier, yeah, so quantifier specify a set of values the variable may take. And they're just, they're general values. Um, and once we assign a quantifier to a predicate, then we can assign a value of true or false to that predicate. So we'll, we'll look at some examples. So universal quantification is the conjunction of every possible value for a variable in the predicate. So conjunction asks the question, is the predicate x greater than zero true for all possible values of x? So when we say conjunction, um, what we mean is this, right? Conjunction is a bunch of, bunch of propositions um, anded together log with, uh, with logical ands, so to speak. All right, and we write it as this upside down A, and we would say for all X elements of the, which is in the natural numbers, so this, uh, this strange N is used to represent natural numbers, and if you would write it, you would write something like this. Um, you would double up that line, although that's pretty sloppy. Um, so we'd say for all X that's in the natural numbers, uh, X is greater than zero, all right? And we read it aloud, of course, as for all x. <clears throat> and if we know that the universe of discourse is the natural numbers, then we can, we can write it as just for all x, x greater than zero. Um, I, put, I use brackets here, but I believe this is also acceptable. Uh, in particular, we will accept that. <clears throat> so as long as, you, as long as there's some way to uh, discriminate between uh, the variable that is being quantified and the predicate, then, uh, then you should be fine. Um, all right, so we'll look at another example. Or actually, this is the same example. So P of X is the predicate X greater than zero. Um, the universe of discourse is all the natural numbers. Then for all X, X greater than zero is equivalent to for all X P of X. And that's equivalent to this. And this is a, 
this is a logical expression that you've seen before, or some form of it. You maybe have not seen the ellipses and the infinity, um, but the the format is the same. Is uh, it should be familiar. You have the uh, logical ands. It's just a it's just a very large conjunction, an infinitely sized conjunction in here. And it operates the same way. That is, if p of x is false for any value of x, then for all x, p of x uh, has a value of false. So anytime we and these things together, each one of these propositions must be true in order for the whole thing to be true. All right, good. Any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some more examples. Uh, so let the universe of discourse be uh, the numbers one, two, and three again. So these are all the values that we're, uh, we're considering for this uh, variable x. And let p of x be the predicate x is greater than two. Then we know there's at least one value of x that gives p of x a value of true, all right? So uh, if x happens to take on the value of three, then this evaluates the true. And if it takes on uh, one or two, then it evaluates the false. So for all, if we say for all x here, then that's going to evaluate the false. But we wanna be able to express that, hey, there's some values that, uh, that evaluate the true. So yeah, how do we express this? Well, yeah, of course, we can take the disjunction of all the possible values, um, feed them into our predicates, and so we get uh, this, or this, or this, and these are the logical ors that we saw from uh, two weeks ago. Um, and if we look at the, of course, the truth table for this, this is true um, if any of these are true. So we don't need all of them to be true, we just need one to be true. Um, so yeah, let's look at uh, a larger example. So we're gonna take the universe of discourse to be all integers, that is uh, from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. And again, P of X is gonna be the predicate X greater than two. So we know that there's at least one value of X that gives P of X a value of true. There's actually an infinite number. However, uh, not all the values that X can take on give P of X a value of true, just some of them. So how do we want to express this? Well, again, we could take the disjunction of all of them, but now we have this very, very sort of awkward um, expression. So where we go from negative infinity um, through uh, zero and then up to positive infinity. And this, is, again, it's a valid way to express this. Uh, this is a, a perfectly reasonable, logical expression. Um, it's just awkward and clunky. So uh, we use existential quantification. So existential quantification is the disjunction of every possible value for a variable in the predicate. It asks the question, does there exist a value for x that makes the predicate x greater than two true? So this is referring, of course, to our example. And we would write it using this backwards e, and we would say it, um, there exists an x that's an element of the integers such that x is greater than two. All right, so note that this z, and again, you can write it something like this. Um, it's used to represent the natural numbers, uh, not natural numbers, integers. <clears throat> that's the one thing I dislike about slides is you get these mistakes and then these, they're there forever in somebody's copy of the slides. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so right, if we know that the universe of discourse is the integers, then we can write there exists an x uh, such that x is greater than two. And again, this is, it's perfectly reasonable to write it like this. Okay, yeah, so I've added a few uh, effects to, uh, to how we progress through the slides. Uh, it's the equivalent of Morning radio, it's a lot of flashy and, uh, but whatever, it should maybe slightly more interesting than regular uh, slides. Okay, so let P of X be the predicate X is greater than two and let uh, the integers be the universe of discourse. Then there exists an X such that X is greater than two. 
is equivalent to uh, their existent x p of x, and that is equivalent to this disjunction of all the possible values that x can take on. All right. So if p of x is true for any value x, uh, then this evaluates to true, right? And that's just simply the logical or. Um, that's the rules for the logical or. If any of these are true, then this whole expression will evaluate to true. Okay, I think. All right. So uh, yeah, and then to sum sum it up. So for all x element of some set, you know, some arbitrary um, universe of discourse. Um, so for all x, p of x is shorthand for uh, the conjunction of all of those. Uh, predicates uh, feeding each individual value in and uh, there exists an x element of this set p of x is shorthand for the disjunction of all these predicates um, given uh, you know specific values for each one okay any questions so far we're following all right <clears throat> So all possible values that variables in a predicate might be assigned is the universe of discourse. So we've been over that. Informally, the universe of discourse is everything that we consider with our assertions. However, uh, the choice of the universe of discourse is critical. It actually can change the value and the meaning of a predicate. So we, when we do uh, these uh, quantified predicates, uh, and when we do predicates in general, we want to uh, make sure that we are very specific about what our universe of discourse is because when we give one universe, uh, we can give one universe of discourse that has one meaning and a different universe of discourse that gives an entirely new meaning to it. And so we'll look at some of these. Uh, so let S of X denote the assertion that X is a student. Um, and let's consider these two predicate logic expressions. So there exists an X such that X is a student and for all X, X is, uh, X is a student. So what are the truth values of these expressions if the universe discourse is uh, one, all the people in this Zoom session. So we'll look at that. Uh, two, the people in the chat. We'll look at that also. And three, the people speaking, um, which is just me. So this is, so we'll look at the, if the universe of discourse were all of these three things, and we'll see what sort of uh, implications that has. So if the universe of discourse is the people in this Zoom session, then the predicate there exists X such that S of X, well, so that means that there exists somebody in this Zoom session uh, that is a student, right? And if you wanna get sort of flowery about your language, there exists an entity that is a person in this session that is also a student. Right, but you can of course shorten that down to, you know, somebody in this session is a student. And uh, that would have a value of true, right? So somebody on this Zoom session is definitely a student. Uh, maybe not everyone, but definitely somebody. <clears throat> um, if the universe of discourse is people in this Zoom session, then the predicate for all X, uh, X is a student. So given all the entities that are people in this session, it is true that these entities are students. Now this is sort of maybe a little bit too roundabout, a little bit too flowery. You could say that uh, everyone in this session is a student. All right, so that's, an equivalent English language statement for that. Uh, that has a value of false, right? Since um, I am in this session and I am not a student. So we can't say that everybody here uh, is a student. What if it's the people in the chat? Well, I made the mistake of entering the chat. So when I, <laughs> when I did this example, I had not been in the chat. Uh, so let's pretend that I uh, didn't write anything in the chat at this point. So let's say the universe of discourse is the people in the chat. Uh, then the predicate, there exists an X such that X is a student. So there exists an entity that is a person in the chat that is also a student, right? So somebody in the chat is a student. 
And that has a value of truth. So somebody who is a student has posed a question or stated something in the chat. Um, if the universe of discourse is people in the chat, then the predicate for all X, X is a student. So for everything that is a person in this chat, it is true that that entity is a student. Basically, everyone that's in the chat is a student. Um, has a value of true, we assume. So actually, uh, if we're looking at our, since I've already been in the chat, this is should be false. But if we just pretend that I haven't been there, then we can assume that it's true. Um, if the universe of discourse is people speaking, then the predicate there exists an X such that X is a student. There exists an entity that is a person speaking that is also a student. So somebody speaking is a student. It might be a simpler way to write that. Someone speaking is a student. And that is a value of false, um, since I'm the only one that's speaking and I'm not a student. All right, so given the same predicate logic expressions, we change the universe of discourse, we're changing the meaning of, uh, of these expressions. And then for people speaking, for all uh, the people speaking, uh, we are all students. So for everything that is a person speaking, it is true that that entity is a student that of course, as a value of false, since I'm speaking and I'm not a student. All right, is it clear up to this point? Yes, so I said I wouldn't check the chat, but I did. Uh, it is safe to assume that for all gives all the conjunctions of P of N and uh, and there exists gives the disjunctions. That's actually perfectly accurate. It is shorthand for these um, logic expressions. Okay, <clears throat> so let's move on to another example. Um, let S of X denote the assertion that X is a student and let F of X denote the assertion that X is a female. So these are just predicates. Um, and let the universe of discourse be all living things on earth. Okay, so let's look then. So there exists an X such that S of X and F of X. So what are we saying here in English? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? I'll give you a few seconds to type somewhat something out if somebody wants to take an uh, take a shot at answering that. All right. There exists a living thing on earth that is both a student and female. Okay, so uh, did somebody get that? Right. Yeah. That's basically it. So there exists a student that is a female student. That's so when we're talking about English, uh, you know, we can, there's a lot of ways to express the same thing. And that's uh, what you wrote in the chat. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, so there exists, and this is actually kind of a awkward way to write it, but it's still uh, accurate. There exists a living thing on earth that is both a student and female. So let's look at uh, what should this be then? Um, so before we said there exists a living thing on earth that is both a student and female, um, what does this mean in English? Yeah, all living things on earth are female students. Perfect. Um, every living thing on earth is both a student and female. Uh, so what are we saying now? So this is a little bit different. We have an implication. So anybody want to take a shot at that? Um, all entities on earth are female students. If a living thing on earth is a student, it is also female. Yeah. So the second one, uh, so Andre is correct. If a living thing on earth is a student, then it is also female. So what we're saying here, 
you know, if you remember back to our implication, it's uh, sort of a, an if then expression. So we would say, if X is a student, then X is also a female. So what we're saying is that for all living things on earth, if it's a student, then it's also a female. Uh, what are we saying here? So this is a little bit, and maybe a little more strange, but. So this is, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's typing, but I'm gonna, so we're saying there exists a living thing on earth such that if that living thing is a student, then it's female. Um, so yeah, this is actually, we haven't said much because um, the X that exists may not be a student. So we were saying something exists on earth and we're saying, what I know about that thing is that if it's a student, then it's a female, but it may not be a student. So this is very weak assertion, but it's still uh, logically valid. All right, good. All right, so now we've seen uh, logic or predicate logic to English. Let's look at if we can translate from English to predicate logic here. So some monkeys live in forests. Um, and we have here our universe of discourse is all living things on earth. And we'll say that M of X is X is a monkey and F of X is X lives in a forest. So how do we express this as a predicate logic? So some monkeys, so it's not, we can take some hints from the language, right? So we're not saying every monkey, some monkeys live in forests. So we might want to start with there exists an X, right? So there exists an X such that uh, it is a monkey and it lives in the forest, right? So that exists. Some monkeys lives in, live in a forest. Uh, some monkeys live in forests. So there exists a living thing that is a monkey and lives in forests. There is at least one of them. That's what we're saying. At least one earth creature is a monkey and lives in a forest. Uh, what did I do? Oh yeah, so this is, uh, sorry. So I gave you the correct way, but let's look at maybe some other ways that you might want to interpret this. So there exists an entity um, that lives on earth um, such that, I mean, is this, you might be tempted to write this. Some monkeys live in forests. You might be tempted to express it this way, but what are we really saying? Uh, we're saying there's at least one creature, and if that creature is a monkey, then it lives in a forest. So we're not really saying the same thing. Um, this assertion is actually too weak. So we're saying there's something living on Earth, but we don't know if it's a monkey or not. All we know is that if it is a monkey, um, then it lives in a forest. So this is wrong on, on a bunch of different levels. Yeah, so this is basically what I just said. <clears throat> How about all monkeys live in forests? Anybody want to take a stab at that? How to express that in predicate logic? So again, we're probably using the all monkeys. We're looking at the, uh, the keywords. So we would say for all X is a good start. And then we would say, for all living things, if that living thing is a monkey, then it lives in the forest. So it's, it's equivalent to this statement. And it may not, you know, they certainly don't sound the same, but logically they are the same. So a if a living thing on earth is a monkey, then it lives in the forest. So all monkeys live in forests. We're not saying monkeys exist, exist but we're saying if they do, then they definitely live in forests. 
so all monkeys live in forests, we might be tempted to write like this, right? But what we're really saying here is, is something different. We're saying for all the living things on earth, they are both a monkey and live in a forest. So every creature on earth is a monkey and lives in a forest. That's too strong. Um, we've asserted too much here. We've, we've overstepped our bounds. So you really have to be careful when you're using uh, there exists and for all and uh, yeah. Um, and given your, uh, so logically you might be tempted to express things the, the wrong way. So just, just be aware of, of what exactly these things mean. <clears throat> Okay, any questions so far on, on these translations? Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, so that's basically, let's say everything you need to know. We, we'll, we'll hit a few more examples, but that's, you know, we've, we've translated from English to uh, these predicate logic expressions and back again. And that should be, uh, we should hit all the notes that we, we needed to hit so far. Why the last statement was too strong and is there a special character for such that? Um, I believe the character for such that, so there's a couple things you can write. Um, ST is often used for such that. And if you're using set builder notation, you might say, uh, write something like this such that x is greater than two. Um, we're gonna get to this. Uh, this comes later in the course. Um, but yeah, this, this me will mean such that, uh, or this, depending, if you're writing English, um, it's sort of acceptable to write that. Uh, why was the last statement too strong? Um, because we've said that, we haven't said that all, well, we've said that all monkeys live in forests, but we also said that all living creatures on earth are monkeys and they live in forests. So that's too strong, right? So we, we have asserted that all monkeys live in forests, but we've also asserted, in addition to that, we've asserted that also everything that lives on earth is a monkey, uh, which we didn't want to say. So that's why it's too strong. It's sort of, it does hit this, it is correct here, but it also says something else in the process that we didn't want to say. Whereas if we say, uh, if we use this one, then we're saying, uh, well, there are a bunch of living things on Earth, and the ones that are monkeys live in forests. So that's, that's why that's too strong. All right. <clears throat> All right, so now is there a relationship between existential quantifiers and universal quantifiers? So if we know something about one, what can we say about the other? Um, so let's take a, an unspecified predicate P. We'll just look at some general example. Um, so if we say there exists X, what we're saying is there exists at least one entity for which P can be, a, P is true. Our assertion P is true. So let's assume that this expression was known to be true. Uh, what could we conclude about these two expressions? So for all x, p of x, uh, and for all x, not p of x. Uh, so let's say that, uh, um, yeah, so if we want to, if we want to sort of draw uh, see what parallels exist. So one way that we can explore that is using a truth table. Um, all right, so let's look at the truth table. So we're saying there exists an X such that P of X. Um, can we conclude that for all X, P of X? So we're saying that uh, there exists a monkey that lives in the forest. Uh, does that mean all monkeys live in the forest? So we can't really conclude anything about that. Um, well, yeah, we don't know if this is false or not. We know that um, at least one monkey lives in the forest, if we use that example, um, but we don't know if all the monkeys live in the forest. 
But what if we said that uh, there does not exist a monkey that lives in the forest? Uh, what can we say about this? And I believe that's an old uh, chat message, but if there's not a monkey that lives in the forest, then we can conclude false. So if we know something about this expression, we know a little bit about this expression, but let's look over here now. So there exists a monkey that lives in the forest, and this is uh, all monkeys do not live in forests. Right, so if this is true, I say, that, well, there's at least one monkey that lives in the forest. Uh, should this be true or false? Yeah, so that is false. So if we know this, we can conclude this. And if this is false, so we could say that um, there does not exist a monkey that lives in the forest. Uh, what can we conclude about all monkeys that do not live in forests? What's the, what's the value that we would put here? Yeah, true. So, and it gets a little bit awkward. It gets a little bit clunky because you're using, oftentimes we're going to be using double negatives. And so you have to sit, it's not a natural way to express things. So maybe you have to think about it a little bit. But if you do think about it, we're saying, there is not a single monkey, there does not exist a monkey anywhere that lives in a forest. And we're saying basically the same thing here. All monkeys do not live in forests. Or we're saying the opposite thing here. Um, so we're saying that this is true. So here this is false, and here this is true. Well, we're saying the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, I expressed that strangely, but yeah, if this is false, then this is true. And uh, you know, you should convince yourself of this because <clears throat> I'm tripping over those statements. Right, so if there exists a monkey that lives in the forest is true, then um, all monkeys do not live in forests are false, is false. And on the other side, if that is false, then this is true. So let's take it one step further. Uh, if we negate this now, then we switch the false to a true and the true to a false. And now uh, the nice thing is this is equivalent to this. Right? So that means these two expressions are equivalent. Um, these are logically equivalent expressions. Right? If I say there exists a monkey that lives in the forest, or let's see if I can translate that to English. So not all monkeys do not live in the forest, which is sort of awkward and bordering on very difficult to uh, interpret, but it, they are logically equivalent things. So you have the double negative there. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at sort of things in the opposite direction now. Uh, first of all, actually, any questions or any more questions? So this is sort of the this is the thing we want to get at. We want to kind of ignore this. This is, again, you can conclude a little bit here, but um, when we are when we're talking about uh, equivalent quantifier, negating a quantifier, we're, we're we're talking about this. Ah, yes, the triangle made of points. So somebody was asking what this is. So that means therefore. Um, yeah, so there's, there is a lot of math notation. And if, if you don't recognize something, by all means, speak up. Uh, yeah. OK, so let's look at the opposite direction now. So if we say, uh, for all x, p of x, and assume this expression is true, what can we say about these? And then if we assume this expression is false, uh, what can we say about these two expressions? So again, let's go to the truth table. Um, so here we're saying all monkeys live in forests. So does there exist a monkey that lives in the forest? Um, yeah. That's true. 
Um, oops. If this is false, so no monkeys live in the forest. Uh, Does there exist a monkey that lives in the forest? That looks to be, yeah, unknown. Did I get that wrong? I feel like that's wrong, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank here. So there exists a monkey that lives in the forest. So we're saying that not all monkeys live, yeah, so unknown, correct, all right. Sorry, I got a little bit, yes. I got a little bit confused there. So unknown, so, but we can conclude, uh, if this is true, all monkeys live in the forest, then there uh, exists a monkey or, yeah, there exists a monkey that does not live in the forest. Is Right, right. So in this case, we can say there exists a monkey that does not live in the forest. That's false, because we know that all monkeys live in forests. Uh, whereas if we know that no monkeys live in the forest, then there exists a monkey that does not live in the forest is true. So um, we can conclude sort of the, uh, again, we have uh, this column here and this column here being opposites. And so if we take the negation of that, uh, we have true here and we have false here. And we have, again, these columns match, which means that these are logically equivalent expressions. So if I say for all x, p of x, that's the same thing as saying um, there does not exist an x um, such that not p of x. So there does not exist a monkey that does not live in the forest. Again, that's really awkward to say, but uh, they're logically equivalent. <clears throat> right, so uh, yeah, and this basically sums up what we've just talked about. They are somewhat uh, the existential quantification and universal quantification are somewhat complementary. That is, we can conclude things uh, about one um, if we know something about the other. <clears throat> so let's say, so let's look at some more examples here. Uh, suppose we want to negate the sentence, everyone in this class is a student. So uh, for all x, s of x. Um, so now we're saying uh, not everyone in this class, uh, so I used P of X here, pretend they're the same. So I'm saying not all, uh, not everyone in this class is a student. So what, if I, I want to use the existential quantifier, then how, what would I express that as? So not everyone in this class is a student is true if and only if um, there is someone in this class, right? So that's true if somebody in this class is what? Not a student, right? So if at least one person in this class is not a student, so there exists an X, such that not p of x, uh, and yet yeah, let's pretend that this is a p. <clears throat> Suppose we want to negate the sentence, somebody in this class is an alien. So there exists an x such that s of x, where s of x is, uh, x is an alien. Um, so to negate it, we're saying there is not somebody in this class was an alien and again I <laughs> I reversed them but again I reversed them in the opposite direction that's fantastic so we're saying there's not a single person in this class who is an alien which is true if and only if uh, what yes every person is not an alien so great everyone in this class is not an alien so you can see kind of how these are logically equivalent statements.
so let's negate everyone in this class as a student. Um, so not everyone in this class is a student. It's true if and only if what? So now we want to use the existential quantifier. So there exists at least one person in this class who is not a student, right? So in general, the rule kind of always applies the same. If I want to negate um, some quantified expression, so for all or there exists, I want to take the negation of that. Um, so if I want to negate for all x, p of x, um, I would swap the quantifier and I move the negation inwards to the predicate, all right? And this is sort of a general rule that you can just apply without really thinking too much. Um, and the meaning of our statement is preserved. <clears throat> okay, and this of course goes in the opposite direction as well. If I say there exists an x, p of x, and I negate it, um, this is logically equivalent. So now I'm just going to flip this to for all. And I'm going to move this negation sign inward to P of X, right? So these are logically equivalent expressions as well. And this is just a little heuristic about how you can sort of easily translate one to another. Okay. Any, uh, any questions? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So predicates are not limited to a single variable. So we're gonna go through a couple more examples and then we'll, we'll hit our break pretty soon and then, uh, and then we'll start on the next topic. Um, so for example, we can have a predicate with an X and a Y. We could say X plus Y is greater than two, uh, but now we know we don't know anything about X and we don't know anything about Y necessarily. Uh, but we can use multiple quantifiers uh, to transform them into expressions with a truth value. Uh, basically, we could say there exists an x such that for all y, x plus y is greater than 2. And uh, again, this depends on, on our universe of discourse. So depending on the universe of discourse we select, this might be true or this might be false. If we're talking about the, uh, the whole numbers, then there exists an X such that for all Y, X plus Y is greater than two is of course true because I can take X equal to three. And since Y can't be negative, then uh, any Y I want to supply in here can make this predicate true. But if I take the integers, well, if I say X is equal to three, then I can take Y equal to negative three and uh, so this is not true in the case of the, of the integers. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so there exists an X such that every Y satisfies the expression X plus Y is greater than two. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples of that and then we'll, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. So let the universe of discourse be all people and how would we translate the following expressions? So this means that X likes why right so what we're saying here is what there exists an x and there exists a y such that x likes y but what might that mean uh let's say if we wanted to translate it into a, a better english sentence there is somebody that likes somebody yeah somebody likes somebody exactly um so we're not saying we're not we are saying something um, but we're not saying too much specific. We're just saying, well, somebody out there likes somebody else. Uh, what if we said for all X and for all Y, uh, X likes Y? What does that mean? Yeah, if we want to translate that into English. Uh, basically, this is everybody likes everybody right so everybody uh, for all x likes everybody else okay good questions or we can move on 
All right, a few more examples. <clears throat> Let's see, how do we translate this into English? Anybody want to take a stab? So he would say there exists somebody that likes everybody, right? So there is an X such that uh, for all Y, X likes Y. So at least one person likes everybody. Uh, what if we switch these around? There an X such that everybody. So here we say for all X, there exists a Y such that X likes Y. So what is that? Everyone likes somebody. Yeah, everybody likes at least one person. However, it's not necessarily the same person. So we say there exists a Y. What we're saying is that everybody likes for each, for each of these X's, there is one Y, but it might not be the same Y. So that's, that's the last one just repeated here. For each X, there exists a Y uh, such that, um, you know, that X likes some Y. Well, what have we said here now? So here we said there exists a Y such that for all X, X likes Y. Everyone likes, there's at least one person that's liked by everyone, all right? So there's, I mean, and it's, it's a bit of a subtle difference, but this, when we say there exists a Y, we've, this is the same Y for everyone now, just by reversing the order of these, all right? So they have different meanings. Okay, is that clear? Questions on using predicates with more than one uh, variable? Okay, I believe that's it for these set of slides. Um, so we'll take a, a 10 minute break and then start the second set of slides. Uh, second set of slides will probably take about an hour as well, but then I have uh, a few examples at the end that I will run through that anybody who wants to stick around and run through can uh, can do so. Um, but for now, so I have a time of uh, 6.34, let's call it 6.35. So we'll come back at uh, 6.45 um, and uh, yeah, so 6.45. <clears throat>
Okay, 6.45. So um, if there's any questions, you can type them out in the chat. Otherwise, I'll be uh, uh, moving on to uh, the next set of slides. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so the next topic, so we're going to deviate a little bit from, uh, there we go. So we're going to deviate a little bit from the uh, step that we just learned um, to this topic, inference and argument. So basically, a lot of the stuff that uh, we've been doing has been leading up to this point. Um, and again, so these are based on slides by Dr. Robert Collier. Um, and I've modified them so any mistakes that you find are, are definitely mine. <clears throat> um, yeah, so inference and argument. So we're going to we're gonna learn how to basically reason about something. Given a, a set of facts, we're going to learn how to conclude other things. So this is um, the stuff that we just learned um, for all in there exists. And so now we're going to uh, look at this part. So we're going to look at what is an argument, what is a valid argument, what is a sound argument. Um, and how do we infer, uh, knowing a set, some fact, uh, how do we infer other facts? And we're going to look at how to basically uh, write a proof. Um, so an argument is an assertion of the form uh, P1 and P2 and uh, et cetera, et cetera, up to PK implies some conclusion C. So the, the, the P1, P2, um, is a collection of premise statements, and C is the conclusion statement. Okay, and uh, so an argument is, is essentially um, an implication. So we've learned about implication, um, and so if if it's an implication and it's a valid implication, implication if all our premises are true, then we should be able to conclude uh, C. Our conclusion must be true. So we'll see some examples of what that looks like. Um, yeah, so we call an argument valid um, if the conclusion is true whenever the premises are all true. All right, and it's, yeah, and if, uh, that implies sort of, so it's, it's valid if it's a valid implication. And so what do I mean by valid implication? Um, if this statement evaluates the true, Right. So if this evaluates, if this equals false, then that's uh, not valid or invalid. Okay. So um, we want an implication that evaluates the true, and then we have sort of a valid implication, and that means by extension we made a valid argument. Right. So if we if we take all of our premises and and the conjunction of all our premises and assign them to some proposition P, then um, it's a valid argument if uh, P implies C is true, and uh, this one line here is not true. So this is, um, don't get too caught up on this. Uh, this is to sort of help you understand. If it's not helping you understand, don't worry about it. Um, I like to think of them as implications. I, I find it works well for me, but you can also... Uh, there's other models that work equally as well. Um, so if that's not working for you, uh, don't be alarmed. <laughs> so an argument is in a sense an implication, which means that a valid argument does not necessarily have a true conclusion, right? So we have implications where uh, C can be false, but this entire thing can evaluate to true. Does anybody remember? Uh, how that happens? Did everybody remember the, the truth table for implication? Well, I just showed it to you. Yeah, when the premises are not fulfilled. Yeah, uh, when the premises are, are false, right? So let's say I make this argument. Uh, premise one, in order to complete my Bachelor of Computer Science, uh, sufficiency and necess necess necessarily, yeah. Sufficiency and necessity, yes, they uh, 
but those are another way to say um, implication, right? Those are just um, English English words that you can use to express an impl implication. So yeah, it's you can express um, a valid argument using uh, necessity and sufficiency, uh, definitely. Um, I'm not going to do that here because I sometimes get them confused. Um, so premise one is in order to complete a Bachelor of Computer Science with honors, you must receive at least 30 credits. So I've made some assertion here. This is a premise. Um, and so this has a value of true or false, right? We can, we can look it up. It's a fact and maybe it's true and maybe it's not. Premise two, Mr. X has not received 30 credits. Again, this is a fact and it's verifiable. I can say, I can look up Mr. X's transcript and see if he's received 30 credits or not. And let's pretend that this is a real person, not a variable. And so in conclusion, I could say, uh, Mr. X could not have completed uh, a Bachelor of Computer Science with honors. So this is my argument I'm making. And it's, you know, it's of the form P1 and P2 implies C. Um, the one problem with it is um, a Bachelor of Computer Science and honors requires 20 credits. So that means this first premise here is false. And then, uh, yeah, P1 is false. The C can also be false by the rules of implication. So this argument looks like this. And if I say false and anything, um, this here, uh, anything logically anded with false uh, is equal to false. So now I have false implies C. And for implication, anytime my antecedent is false, uh, this whole thing evaluates to true. Uh, because it's, I've said basically nothing. Um, all right, so is that clear? Any, any questions on this? Like I said, I like to think of it as an implication, um, and it is, but uh, you sort of have to get used to a few other ideas about implications. And uh, anyway, we'll go over that. <clears throat> so in addition to being valid, we may also classify an argument as being sound. So an argument is valid if the conclusion follows from the premises, right? So if it's a valid implication. Um, an argument is sound if it is valid and all the premises are true. Right, so basically I have something like P1 and P2 implies C. Um, so if, if this entire expression evaluates to true, then that's valid. And if P1 and P2 is equal to true, um, then it's sound as well, okay? Yeah, so a sound argument implies that the conclusion is true. Right, if we can say that it's a valid implication, um, that means if my antecedent is true, then the, uh, the, the consequent must be true then, um, and I say that, well, the antecedent is true, then of course the, the conclusion must be true. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, um, so deductive arguments are assertions that claim the conclusion definitely follows from the premises. Um, inductive arguments are assertion that the claim uh, that claim the conclusion probably follows from the premises. Uh, this is not to be confused with a topic we're gonna look a little, at a little bit later called induction. So uh, inductive arguments are not the same as induction, although it's unfortunate that we use the same word for both. <clears throat> um, so when we say inductive argument, we say that uh, we're using evidence like a detective or an experimental science, scientist, right? So we just, We've done enough experiments and we've seen the evidence and we can conclude, we can argue that, hey man, all the evidence points to this conclusion. 
Whereas uh, what we're doing is something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to argue from reason. So we're going to say, I know this is true, and I know this is true, and I can therefore conclude that this is true. Um, because I have a valid argument and it's also sound, that means all my premises are true. So inductive arguments argue from evidence. Um, so we're going to cover deductive arguments. That's what we're doing here. <clears throat> so we're not gathering evidence. We are saying, uh, basically, I know these things are true, and I can conclude that these other things are true. <clears throat> so a deduction is an argument using intermediate conclusions. So when we talk about uh, proofs, a lot of times we, we talk about lemmas. So we make these um, intermediate conclusions. So we might have these premises. Let's say we know P1, P2, and P3 are all true, and we can therefore conclude C1. Uh, and we know that these premises are all true, and so we could conclude that this is true. And uh, likewise here, we can conclude we know that C1 and C2 and C3 are all true. Um, then we can use those to form another argument of this type. So we can say, well, um, since I know these are true, then I can conclude C. So that's what uh, a deduction is. It's a, we're basically um, providing some intermediate steps, right? So I could sort of chain all these premises together and then conclude C, but um, that gets a little bit unwieldy and, and hard to understand. So we do, we tend to break it down into smaller arguments. So a proof is a deduction where all the premises are known to be true statements. Equivalently, a proof is a sound deduction. So sound means all my premises are true. Um, so for example, if we look at this, uh, this argument again, uh, this deduction, and if we know that all P1, P2, P3 up to P9 are true, uh, then this is a proof. So it's, it's sound and it's valid. Okay, so this is sort of you know, a generalized overview of, uh, so we're gonna be doing a lot of proofs um, coming up. So this is sort of how you would construct a proof. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at the, uh, Let's look at some examples of how to argue. And uh, so if I say, if I have a doctorate in computer science, then I must have written a thesis. Um, and I have written a thesis, therefore I must have a doctorate in computer science. Uh, but what is wrong with this argument? So the conclusion and all the premises are true. So is this a, a valid and sound argument? Or can anybody spot uh, a problem with it. Deduction is wrong. Yeah, the deduction is wrong. That's, uh, yeah, let's take a look at it. Actually, let's break it down a little bit. So let's, uh, I have a doctorate in computer science is D and let T be I have written a thesis. So our argument is then that um, if I have a doctorate, then I've written a thesis. So that's this logical expression. And I've also said uh, this. So this is, I've said that I've written a thesis. So in a sense, this is P1 and this is P2. And for this to be um, a sound valid argument, then both of these should be true. Um, and then I can conclude this, but, right, so I'm saying that Given this argument, or this premise and this premise, I'm going to conclude that D is true. But let's take a look at the truth table for that. Um, and if you don't, if you're not following right now, that's that's okay. So this is just this is a common thing that happens. If I say uh, D implies T, and then T, then I can conclude D. So I. I've actually just done the implication in reverse, which is uh, uh, there's a there's a phrase for it. Um, it's a I think it's the uh, implication fallacy. So this happens uh, quite often when you're new to this stuff. Is that you do this implication fallacy? Um, but if I if I break down my argument, I've argued um, D implies T. So let's look at uh, so that's true in this case. 
false here, uh, true here, and true here. And then my other argument, or my other premise was just uh, that I've written a thesis. So that's uh, true here, false here, true here, false here. And now I'm saying, when this is true, when both of those are, uh, premises are true, then I can conclude that this is true. So if we, if we again, we take the uh, conjunction of these two premises, then it's true here, false here, true here, and false here. So what, when we argued that, what we said is that if this is true, then we can conclude that D is true. However, um, in this case, we conclude that D is true, but in this case, D is actually false. So this is not, uh, it's not a valid argument. Um, we haven't logically, we haven't logically concluded that uh, this does not follow from these premises. Okay, so that's, it's a, it's a common error. But, and uh, yeah, again, I like this representation. I like to, to understand it by going back to these first principles, but if that doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. If this is, uh, um, hopefully uh, you can still um, realize that uh, this argument was, uh, this does not logically follow from these two uh, premises. Hopefully you can, uh, you can see that. <clears throat> okay, so there's two ways an argument can be considered unsound. Any questions actually before we go on? Okay. <clears throat> so if we have one or more false premises, it's not a sound argument and the conclusion does not follow logically. Uh, so that's, that's another way to think of it. It doesn't logically follow. If I say that, um, if I look back at that other old argument, if I have a, a doctorate, I must have completed my thesis and I uh, completed my thesis, therefore I can conclude that I have a doctorate. That's, that doesn't logically follow. We have one or more invalid arguments. <clears throat> um, so inference is a systematic process of deriving conclusions from the premises. So we could go back to that old example and uh, use this system of inference to see if we can get to the conclusion of, I have a doctorate. Um, systematic because, <laughs> sorry, this should not be here till later. So it is systematic because there are inference, inference rules, so we can apply them, they're very, uh, you know, given some input, we know what output we're gonna get. Um, and these rules have the following form, given P, uh, conclude Q. And another way to write that is basically it's an implication. So if I know that P is true, then I can conclude that Q is true. Um, thus inference is a set of known valid arguments, uh, valid implications where we know the antecedent is true. So I know that P is true, Therefore, Q must always be true um, if this is valid. All right, so now I've sort of spit a lot of things at you. Um, so now we'll get into some, some more concrete stuff here. Um, so if we define a knowledge base as a collection of statements known to be true, um, we can specify an informal algorithm for constructing a proof for a conclusion C. So in that old example, we could have taken those premises we could have worked our way down to, if it was a valid argument, we could have worked our way down to uh, the conclusion um, using these rules of inference. And so here they are. And these are, in a sense, similar to what we saw uh, the rules before where propositions were equal. The difference here is that um, when I say that I'm given these two things, uh, what that means is I know that they're true. So if I'm given P and Q, that means I know that those are facts. So those are true. So that's different from being logically equivalent. So logically equivalent means that, well, when one is false, the other is false. When one is true, the other is true. So here are these inference rules. I know that they're true, or I'm assuming they're true, or I have it on, you know, 
it's reliably reliable that it's true. So given these two things, I could say that, and if I know that both P and Q are true, then I know that P and Q is true. And you can basically verify that uh, quite quickly using um, a truth table, right? So the only case where P and Q are both true are here. So therefore we can conclude P and Q. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? For any questions? Okay. So simplification. So we can go in the opposite direction as well. So if I know that this is true, well, what can I conclude? Well, if I know that P and Q are true, then I know that P must be true and also know that Q must be true. Right? And again, you can just go back to the truth table and see that, well, when that's true, uh, both of these must be true. And Anytime it's false, we don't care. Uh, so, so none of this matters here. All that matters is this one row. <clears throat> so we have a rule called addition. So given that P is true, I can conclude uh, P or some other proposition, right? And this makes sense because uh, when P is false, I don't care. Um, I'm only worried about when P is true. So when P is true, P or Q is always going to evaluate true, whether, whether Q is true or false. Okay, so uh, hopefully that makes sense. And resolution is another rule. Um, so if I say P or Q and not P or R, then I can conclude Q or R. So again, what I'm saying is I know this is true, and I know this is true. And I can conclude that this will evaluate to true. And you can sort of, um, you can go through it. It's a little more complex than, uh, than the other ones we're looking at. But what you can do is say, um, so I skipped a step here where I, where I evaluated this not P. But if I said, well, P or Q is true, so P or Q is true on these ones, and not P or R is true, so that's here, 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 here. Uh, so when both of those are true, and here, so when both of those are true, that's uh, this row, this row, this row, and this row, right? So when both of these are true, um, I can conclude that Q or R is true. Again, this is a little more complicated. You don't have to know all of this. Um, it's just a, it's one way to sort of get to this conclusion given from first principles. But if you, you can just memorize this, that's fine. <clears throat> you don't have to understand all that. <clears throat> There's modus ponens. So if I know that P is true and P implies Q, um, I can conclude that Q must be true. Oops. And modus, modus tollens. Um, so if I know that P implies Q is true, but I know that uh, Q, not Q is true, uh, then I conclude that uh, not P must be true. So we can sort of see that if we, uh, Again, let's quickly write up our, uh, we have enough room here. So if I say true, 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 false, false, true, false, false, um, then this should be true, false, true, true. So I'm saying if, in a sense, I'm saying Q is false here. So that's this one and this one. Um, and I'm saying that this is true. So that's this one. Um, then P must be false. Oops. And maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe it doesn't. Um, if it doesn't, I would advise you for this one, I would advise you actually to look at the truth table and, and work it out until you can figure out why that this is uh, true. But 
I'm saying if you can, it's enough to memorize these though, but yeah. Any questions? Everybody's sufficiently confused. Hypothetical syllogism. All right. Somebody asked me, I think, uh, do I have to memorize these on the quizzes and the, uh, on the quizzes? Uh, well, no, all the quizzes are, and I said I didn't know, but then I, as I was thinking about it, all the quizzes are open book, right? Um, you can access your notes for the quizzes. So you don't have to memorize these. Um, do have your notes handy. Um, <clears throat> so given P implies Q and Q implies R, I can conclude that P implies R. And uh, that should make sense to you. It's uh, just this transitive quality of implication. Um, disjunctive syllogism, I'm saying P or Q is true. And I'm saying not P is true. So I'm basically saying P is false. Well then, uh, for P or Q to evaluate to true, it must be the fact that Q is true. Okay. All right. Any questions? So those are all the rules, basically. Um, how are we doing? Seven eleven. All right. Lots of time left. So these are the rules of inference that you'll be using. Um, any questions on any of them? All right. Good. Um, so this is a repeat as before. If we define a knowledge base as a collection of statements known to be true, we can specify an informal algorithm. So let's specify that algorithm. Um, or let's actually, we're going to go through an example first. So use the following premises to construct an argument. Hello? So use the following premises to construct an argument uh, for the conclusion that you submitted your assignment early. So let's say here is our set of premises. So these are facts that we uh, know to be true. So if the internet was down or you did not submit your assignment early, you will have failed the assignment and disappointed your parents. So let's say that that's true. <clears throat> if you failed the assignment, you would not get an A for your final mark. So this is also something we know to be true. And finally, you got an A for your final mark. That's something you know to be true. So given this, we want to conclude that you submitted your assignment early. And we want to do it through these logical steps using these rules of inference. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to do is uh, the same thing we did before. Uh, two weeks ago, we're going to convert these into uh, logic expressions. All right. So we're going to identify the propositions, the atomic propositions, and then we're going to combine them using our operators. And we're going to make these logical expressions. And these are going to be facts in the in our sort of database of things that we know to be true. <clears throat> so we're gonna use the following variables for the proposition. I, the internet was down. S is you submitted early. F is you failed the assignment. D is you disappointed your parents. A is your final mark was an A. <clears throat> all right, so these are all, the, all of our propositions. So let's, this is the first premise that we've stated. This is the first fact in our database, and we want to convert this to a logical expression. So if the internet was down or you did not submit your assignment early, you will have failed the assignment and disappointed your parents. So let's look at, first of all, we want to identify keywords that identify um, operators. So if tends to be associated with implication. We have an or here. And we have an and here. So um, let me say I or S, if I remember those correctly. Uh, so that would say the internet was down or you did not submit your assignment early. And then we might, since we have the if here, um, we'll put the implication and then uh, what do we have for the final part? If we go back to, um, so failed the assignment and disappointed your parents, I believe that's F 
and D. So what is this? Oh, whoops. Yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> so the internet was down, so, ah, shit, did I screw that up? Yeah, so let's say that this is the internet was up. <clears throat> So if I say the internet was down, then I'm going to say uh, not I. And S is I submitted the assignment early, so this is not S. Yeah, so my apologies for that uh, mistake. Um, and F is you failed the assignment, and D is you disappointed your parents. So not I or not S implies F and D. If you failed the assignment, then you would not get an A as your final mark. <clears throat> Um, all right, so fail the assignment is F, and getting an A as your final mark is A. Um, so how do we express this as a logical expression? Do want to take a shot? So F implies not A, right. And then finally, uh, you received an A as your final mark. Uh, that's simply uh, the proposition A. <clears throat> so now these are things that we know to be true. These are all facts in our database. All right, so here they are rewritten. Um, so now we want to conclude uh, some other things. So given these, these premises, we want to use our inference rules and conclude something else. So can anybody think of an inference rule? Um, maybe you have a copy of the slides, um, or maybe you have a very good memory, or maybe... But can anybody think of an inference rule where we can um, take these things and conclude something? Modus tollens on two and three. Yeah. So modus tollens means that I say F implies not A, and then I'm concluding A. Well, I can think of A as not not A. So given two and three are true, uh, yeah, that's our knowledge base. I can conclude not F using modus tollens. All right. So I use two and I use three. And I use the rule modus tollens um, to conclude not F. All right. Is everybody clear or does anybody, anybody have questions on that? So going forward, it's a lot of this. It's we're taking what we know to be true, we apply our inference rules, and we conclude uh, sub-conclusions, right? This is a, the whole thing we were talking about with, uh, with making sound deductions. All right, so now, uh, so now we have this not F. So uh, what should we do now? Um, so we can do this addition step. Um, not F or not D, right? So if we know that this is true, then we can or it with anything else. All right, so maybe at this point now, uh, maybe it's clear what step we should take next. So what we want to conclude is that, uh, what do we want to conclude? I think we want to conclude S. We submitted our assignment early. <clears throat> yeah. Modus tollens on 5.1, yeah. Um, but before we do that, but you're right, we just, we've skipped a step here because now we're gonna use not just our rules of inference, but we're gonna use our logical equivalences, right? So we can apply De Morgan's to this uh, not F or not D, and we know that's a logically equivalent to this. And since they're logically equivalent, if this is true, then this must also be true. All right, and then you're right. Um, 
the next step is we can apply, since we have this, not FND, and we have this, uh, this proposition implies FND, then we can apply uh, modus tollens again. Yeah, what gave you the hint that we should add not D? Um, sometimes it's trial and error, and uh, uh, a lot of it is just practice, though. So once you practice, you start to see these patterns. So we'll do. I'm going to do some more examples at the end that I don't have. I don't have the answers prepared, so you you might see me stumble a little bit and try some different things, um, and sort of go through it. And maybe maybe we don't even come to the correct conclusion. Although I think. Uh, two of them are pretty easy, and the last one's pretty, pretty hard. So what you, what what gave you the hint? Um, basically, pattern recognition. I've done enough of them, or well, I mean the answer is here, so I don't need to recognize a pattern. But um, I've done enough of them that I can recognize the pattern. Um, and I know the other thing that I want to that I know is that I want to conclude S, and to conclude S, I need something here. And so modus tollen seems natural. If I go from here, if I can conclude something about F and D, then I can go modus tollens back over here and conclude something about S. So you want to start with, you know, um, find where your conclusion is and then uh, see how you can work backwards to that. So that's another way that you can think of it. Um, so now we have this, uh, which, what should we apply here now? Uh, we're at uh, step seven. What's a rule? What's an inference rule or a logical equivalence? Yeah, De Morgan's again. So we can apply De Morgan's uh, to seven, and we get not not i uh, in conjunction with not not s. And uh, does anybody remember which rule we would apply here? I mean, I think it's clear that these. Uh, yeah, so we're going to use double negation, and uh, we get I and S, and uh, yeah, anybody remember? So if we can conclude that I and S are true, then we know what? Yeah, we can conclude S uh, using simplification. So uh, if we know that I and S is true, then both I and S must be true. So we can conclude S. So we've given our, our initial arguments, we've successfully concluded that uh, you've submitted your assignment early. Uh, based on the fact that you got an A and all the other things that we know. When will the video lecture be posted? Um, I generally post them uh, as soon as I'm done here. Uh, it gets converted and I just upload it to YouTube. I don't really edit it. Um, so yeah, it should be tonight. <clears throat> okay, any questions on any of these steps? All right. So we'll go through another example. So we're gonna use these, the following premises to construct an argument. Uh, in other words, conclude that Mr. X doesn't study. So if Mr. X drinks too much or smokes too much, then he sleeps poorly. Are there practice questions in the textbook for these examples? There are practice questions. If you go to actually the, um, uh, what's it called? The Discrete Math Study Center. So there's a there's a link on CU Learn. Uh, I forget what exactly the, the link is, but there's lots of exercises there. So you can click on your topic, um, and then uh, click on the exercises, and there's uh, practice questions there. So that's sort of the first place I'd recommend. Um, the textbook I'm I'm not as familiar with, um, but I can try and find some for you if you like. <clears throat> So if Mr. X drinks too much or smokes too much, then he sleeps poorly. Um, if he sleeps poorly or doesn't eat well, then he feels ill. When he feels ill, he neither exercises nor studies. And Mr. X smokes too much. So these are all of our facts. So these are all things that we know to be true. 
and we want to conclude uh, that Mr. X doesn't study. All right, so again, we're going to take these, um, we're going to break them down into the atomic, atomic propositions, we're going to make logical expressions and then we're going to use the rules of inference and logical equivalences to argue uh, to come down to this conclusion. So we're going to use the following variables. D is he drinks too much. C is he smokes too much. P is he sleeps poorly. E is he eats well. <clears throat> and I is he feels ill. And X is he exercises. Okay. <laughs> studies. All right, that's a lot of propositions, but let's go. <clears throat> so if Mr. X drinks or smokes too much, then he sleeps poorly. So I don't remember what all those are, but so D is drinks too much, C is smokes too much. And uh, so that's the R, the or is this uh, disjunction and the if and then is this implication, all right? So that is our first uh, fact now expressed in logic. If he sleeps poorly or doesn't eat well, he feels ill. Um, again, you can chime in if you want. I don't remember what all these, uh, what all these variables are. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and, so P is he sleeps poorly. Um, e is he eats well, but we're saying he doesn't eat well. And this or is this or here. And again, we said if, then, and that's implication. And the I is he feels ill. When he feels ill, he neither exercises or drinks. <clears throat> so anybody want to take a stab at that? Even if you don't get the variables right, you can... Uh, what sort of, what, what operator do we think we're using here? So we know I something. So I think, uh, yeah, implication. So I implies uh, that he does not exercise or study, All right? So he neither exercises nor studies, we can uh, express like this. <clears throat> yeah, not exercising and studying. Um, yeah, so if you applied to Morgan's, then you could say he does not exercise and he does not study. Uh, that's something that we're going to uh, get to when we start arguing. <clears throat> uh, so Mr. X smokes too much. Uh, C. So these are all our facts. These are all the things we know to be true. Now let's argue that, what are we arguing again? Uh, I forget what were we arguing. Doesn't study. Okay, good. Okay. So S is study. So we want to conclude uh, not S. This is what we want to conclude. <clears throat> and so again, uh, where we want to get to is uh, well, this is the only place that S appears. So somehow uh, it would be nice if we can conclude maybe I, uh, and then we can use modus ponens to get there. So how are we gonna conclude I? Um, well, if you work backwards, so the, the one thing that we know for sure is C. So maybe we can uh, conclude something up here. So what's maybe uh, our first, what should our first step in our, in our arguments be? Right, so we want to do addition. So we can do, uh, yeah, so we can add, oops. 
we can add uh, sometimes Windows, man. So we can add uh, D addition. So this means that we're going to uh, use disjunction. So we know that C is true. So we can conclude C or anything. That's fine. So uh, yeah. So now we have this guy here. So what's our next step? Oh, geez. So the next step is, if we know that this is true, um, we can follow this implication and we can conclude that P is true. So using modus ponens, using five, one and modus ponens. So now we're in good shape. Um, so now we're here, we're headed towards I, which is which we want to head to. Again, we want to conclude not F. Yeah, so we can add not E to that. Right, so if we know that P is true, then we know P or anything is true. So we can say P or not E, and then we can modus ponens exactly to I using seven and two. And then from I, yeah, modus ponens twice. So from I, we can conclude uh, not X or S using modus ponens, and then uh, what do we do here? Does the pattern just modus ponens every time implications pop up? Um, if you can show that the antecedent is true, so the uh, right the left side of the argument, if you can show that that's true, then yeah, modus ponens uh, makes sense. Um, otherwise, maybe you can conclude that the conclusion must be false, or the uh, the uh, consequence must be false. And then you can go in the reverse direction. You can use modus, modus tollens, tollen, yeah. Um, so yeah, you just, and in general, you want to try, you know, you're going to recognize these patterns. You're going to try different things. Uh, we're generally going to give you something that, uh, questions that have some sort of, we'll try and trick you a little bit, but not too much. So you might have a, a couple false leads, but you'll generally be able to, to figure out you know, if you just logically follow modus tollens and modus ponens when they're available, then you'll probably get to the correct answer. <clears throat> um, from here, we can use De Morgan's to get not X and not S. And then uh, since we know that uh, if this is true, then both of the individual uh, propositions must be true. So we know that not S must be true. So yeah, we've concluded that uh, Mr. X doesn't study. Okay, and starting with, you know, four, four facts and working our way through uh, a bunch of other facts, uh, we've come to that conclusion. Good, any questions? Okay, um, so yeah, we're gonna go through, so those are, so we, we had some, um, we made some arguments by translating these English expressions into logical expressions. Um, and now we're just gonna go through some basically generic uh, logical expressions and we're gonna argue, uh, so this is our set of facts, our, our knowledge base, So these are things that we know to be true. Now we want to prove that not R is true. And again, uh, so one way, one heuristic is, well, here's where R is. So we want to, so we know we want, we, we can get there if we know that Q is true. So we want to argue that Q is true somehow. But what we know is that uh, these two are true. So what maybe would be our first argument? One, three, disjunctive syllogism. Let's see if you got, uh, yeah. So, uh, and this is almost exact, oh, oh. Ah, 
Yeah, so I don't have these ones written out. So yeah, one, three and disjunctive syllogism. So um, I can conclude Q from one and three and uh, Okay, and then again, this should be a, a relatively simple argument at this point, yeah, or whatever it's called. Exactly, my thoughts exactly. I <laughs> I still have to look up some of these. Um, so now we know Q, uh, so we can use uh, modus ponens and conclude uh, not R. So then we say uh, four and two. And uh, yeah, so that was a very simple argument. Okay, good. Questions? All right, let's try another one. <clears throat> so here's our knowledge base. We want to prove that P is true. Uh, now, you can see the one place that P appears is right here. So this might be a little more of a complicated argument. So. Right, and I don't have the answers to these, so which, maybe what's a good place to start? So I would start, uh, we know we got to unwrap this at some point, but. Uh, yeah, we can do two, four, uh, what would you say, two modus tollens, uh, three and one, eh? So, uh, and we can, I think that's what you meant, not Q. Uh, modus tollens, one and three. <clears throat> um, that sort of helps us, I guess, but we still have to, um, so we know, yeah, um, well, I mean, we haven't done anything wrong at this point, so this is fine. Uh, yeah, two and four, and we use, uh, what's it called, is that disjunctive syllogism again? So if we use two and four, we can say that um, R and P or Q must be true, uh, two, four, Okay, so now what? Yeah, exactly. So we can use five and six and disjunctive syllogism to conclude that R and P, uh, let's just uh, do this. And then eight, so we want to prove P and now we're, we know that this is true. Um, so we can conclude what? P and that is seven and I believe it's the simplification. Yeah. <clears throat> cool, so we, Again, we've argued using uh, both our rules of inference and our logical equivalences. Okay, any questions? Okay, we have one more. And this one, we'll see, maybe this will stump me, I don't know. <clears throat> and I may run out of space. <laughs> but let's see if we can prove R, or at least get, get some good headway there. <clears throat> um, and here we see R occurs here and here. So we know we gotta break down this big guy here at some point. Um, so one other thing is to note is that, uh, 
Yeah. So this is a conjunction. So we can maybe let's start with uh, a simplification and So this is using uh, four and simplification. And then uh, I want that T, eh? So the other thing to notice is that we can use um, on this part here, uh, since these are this is a conjunction and this is a conjunction. We can use the um, associativity rule. So we can basically take away these brackets and then we can simplify for, um, for instance, we could say T, No, oh, no, I can't do that. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I, uh, I misread the location of the brackets. Can't do that. Oh, what a mess. Can we ignore the implication? Well, we can do, um, no, you can't ignore it. You can do implication equivalences. Um, yeah, this is a good one. Um, all right, let's just try some, let's just throw some stuff at the wall and see what comes out. Basically the stuff after T is fine. So this is all, let me see if I get these brackets correct. So this is, T implies all of this. Um, so we can say T implies not P and Yeah, that's, yeah, we can, uh, yeah, all of this is true. That's good, yeah. So yeah, somebody mentioned that we can do um, we can do one and six now. So this is uh, using four and simplification again. So now we can use one and six and modus ponens to conclude that not p and not r and P implies R, which is nice because now we, this is simply a conjunction. So uh, one, six, Q is true. All right. I'll try and catch up to the chat in one second here. Modus ponens. So Q is true from two after using De Morgan's on two. Ah, uh, yeah, but you, we can conclude that or Q. Um, so we can do, um, so now we, well, we can in, isolate these. So P and not R and that's seven in simplification. Yeah. So yeah, feel free to, I mean, feel free to suggest stuff. I'll try and work through it and see if we can. Um, uh -huh. So nine, we can say not P or R. So that's eight and De Morgan's.
and then we can say r or not q p implies r my goodness yeah okay um that's so that's it for the lecture i'm going to do this i'm going to switch my screen though to give myself more room so i'm going to switch to uh um, one note and we'll continue through this and see if we can prove it. Um, you can stick around and no, I won't make this a test question. No, no, this is meant to be difficult. It's just so we could demonstrate sort of, uh, you can see uh, us try to work through this on the fly and we can all try and work through it together. So I'm going to take this specific example. I'm going to switch my screen to one note so I have more room to, to uh, do this. Actually, I think I can, and then so this is the end of the lecture. Basically, you can stick around for this example if you want, or uh, you know, if you're not interested, and in, you don't have to. <laughs> but uh, that should be a little bit fun. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. <clears throat> okay. So just give me one sec to to. Uh, to set it up and then I will uh, continue with this example. Okay, all right. All right, let me just uh, set up the share. So I started it. Uh, so I'm, I may have come to a few different conclusions here. But uh, this still logically makes sense. I just uh, came at it at a different direction. So if I, uh, I concluded this, of course, through simplification. Of four. And then I did uh, implication equivalence here. So if you can imagine this is a five. And then I used uh, one and seven and disjunctive syllogism. Um, and then eight, I got through seven and simplification. And then this is uh, implication equivalence again. So basically I was doing the same thing we were doing. I was throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what worked. Okay, so let's say this is not exactly what we had before, but it's, these are of course all logically equivalent. So does anybody, yeah, anybody wanna take a stab at the next, uh, yeah, we want to prove. I believe we need to prove R. The Morgan's on two, yeah. We could do that. Um, oh, well, let's do it with that. So we can do, so it's not not Q. I'm going to skip a, skip a step. Um, 
So we're going to say uh, two De Morgans and uh, double negation. I did it in one step. Proving P would prove R, yeah. Um, you could do De Morgan's on three. Well, where is that going to get us, though? I mean, that'll get us. Uh, so what we have here is not P or R. And we have uh, P or not Q. Um, I believe we can do, which one is that? Uh, resolution and get uh, not Q or R. So that is what three, nine in resolution. Yeah, if we could somehow conclude Q. So yeah, if we used, uh, we got the Morgans, so Q and P or Q. So I believe we can, that is a logical equivalence, right? Does anybody remember this one? So Q and P or Q, I think resolves to Q, uh, but I forget the, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. I think it's, uh, I don't remember, um, but I think we can do um, 10 and uh, not P and Q. That, that lets us pew. Um, the problem with that is uh, you end up with a negation outside that. So if I try to do De Morgan's on step three, let's try that. So, and I mean, it's not wrong, but I end up with not, not P and uh, Q. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we can't conclude anything from that. But I, I mean, I think we, we have it basically. Um, so, but I just forget this rule. Uh, it's a logical equivalence where I take this and I conclude uh, Q. Um, yeah. And then given Q, I can conclude, uh, oh my goodness. Absorption, yeah, that might be it. <laughs> I believe that's correct. And then, uh, yeah, then I can do, what is this? Uh, resolution, no, not resolution. Disjunctive syllogism on uh, 11 and 12. So 14 and I can conclude R. Good, so we've proven it on uh, quite a mess. And yeah, that would never, we, we wouldn't give you, any, even on an assignment, I don't think we'd give you anything that complicated, so. <clears throat> okay, uh, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, that's it for today. Um, don't forget to do your assignment by this Saturday and your, um, uh, tutorial. Um, and I'll stick around for questions if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, uh, have a good night. Uh, the tutorials on CU Learn. Um, so there's a there's a section on CU Learn for tutorials, and it it should be you should be able to see it. Uh, you can try it right now. 
um, start submitting, start putting answers and then, uh, you know, don't submit until you're ready. It should be open for the entire week. Uh, you can change your answers and, uh, if you forget to submit it by the deadline, it'll automatically submit. So, uh, one other question. Do the questions on the discrete math center have answers? I don't remember. I would have to check. But if you want an answer to one, uh, uh, post it. Uh, go to. Uh, bring it to office hours and uh, somebody will answer it for you. Um, and if nobody else does, I will. Yeah, practice quiz will be, will be released this week. Um, I still have to, I'm still working on the last question. It's uh, it's a bit of a pain going from written to multiple choice. I still want to give a quality quiz. So um, there's still one, like one and a half questions still outstanding out of five questions. Um, so the practice quiz probably no later than Wednesday, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make an announcement when it's, when it's ready. Uh, the quiz focuses on, let me see here. Um, so the quiz will be uh, truth tables, um, logical equivalences, um, predicate logic, uh, English to logic translations, uh, basically everything we've seen up until now um, inverse, converse, contrapositive, um, excluding, uh, we, we won't get into arguments on this quiz. So, uh, there'll be no proofs, no arguments, but uh, everything up until then, uh, we'll do. Thank you. 